I would have. I told him he was ready to court enforcement. He's ready to inspect all of them. All those taxis? Yeah.
Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council informational meeting. The meeting will start in 60 seconds.
Good afternoon. Welcome to the Sioux Falls City Council informational meeting. Today's date's Tuesday, February 11th. Welcome to all our guests here in Carnegie, anybody watching on CityLink or maybe on the live web stream. We appreciate your interest and look forward to doing the city's business. Uh, today we're going to start with a staff report by Jim David, our legislative and operations manager. Good afternoon, Jim David, council office. Senate Bill 91, which would allow local governments the ability to restrict carrier licenses, did pass the Senate Local Government Committee by or unanimously. Uh, once it did arrive on the Senate floor, it was defeated by a few votes, but the prime sponsor, uh, Senator Krebs, was able to have it reconsidered, and yesterday it passed 26 to 5. House Bill 1104 would allow cities, schools, and counties the option of requiring its vendors to receive payments electronically. That has passed the House by 62 to 6, and it has been referred to the Senate Commerce Committee. And finally, House Bill 1177, the South Dakota Municipal League is leading the effort to defeat this bill, which would replace local texting bans with a statewide texting ban that is a secondary offense. The bill would also remove local control when it comes to distracted driving, thus jeopardizing Sioux Falls' 50-year-old careless driving law. Each of you should have received a draft email, email that will be emailed to the local House members tomorrow morning. If you are interested in having your name attached to that email, please let me know uh, by tonight. Uh, the bill most likely will receive a full House consideration tomorrow afternoon. So I'd be happy to entertain uh, any of your questions. Questions for Jim? No? I, yeah, I do, do we do we have anybody going tomorrow? Do or do we need to? I mean, when it's on the house floor, there's not really opportunity for yeah, testimony from I, individuals. I, I don't think so. We've been given to, we've been in contact with Yvonne Taylor, and the message we've gotten is uh, they don't need anybody from Sioux Falls out there. So, <laughs> okay, we'll take that in the spirit it's so. intended. If I might, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to comment about this. I was going to save it for open discussion, but since Please. Jim brought it up, I just wanted folks to understand, you know, I had uh, friends in Minnesota that said to me this morning, you know, that that this is being reported as a texting ban in South Dakota, a statewide texting ban in South Dakota, and I want people to understand that it it is not the same as what Sioux Falls passed and what other communities passed in South Dakota. And those those ordinances were brought by citizens to the city council. The city council didn't dream that up. That came from a group of really passionate citizens and it passed this council very strongly. So I think what we're seeing is the legislature kind of blowing us off, honestly. And I want people to understand that, that this bill needs to be, either be killed, it needs to be killed, I think, but for sure section four needs to be amended out because that is the piece that so dramatically affects local ordinances, especially, as Jim said, the careless driving ordinance in Sioux Falls. So kill the bill, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Erpenbach. Any other input or questions? Thank you, Jim. All righty, uh, to the point where we are at our city council open discussion. Would any councillor like to share anything today? Councilor Staggers. Yes, I, I was wondering if our city attorney could uh, say something about the petition that was um, submitted last Thursday to the city clerk's office. Um, because um, there is some information here about a Supreme Court decision, Russ versus Sullivan, 1995. Uh, you could say something about that? <clears throat> Please, David. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Staggers, I guess to I can't give you a real short answer, but I'll do the best I can. Mm -hmm. uh, what the Russ v. Sullivan case was, was a 1991 U.S. Supreme Court decision that recognized the doctrine of the government speech. And it was later honed by the Supreme Court in about 2009. If I can find the quote here. In Pleasant Grove City, Utah versus Sumum, it was a 2009 Supreme Court decision essentially stated, a government entity has the right to speak for itself. It is entitled to say what it wishes and to select the views that it wants to express. And that's quoting Russ v. Or, uh, quoting, uh, citing Russ v. Sullivan. The court also held it is the very business of government to favor and disfavor view, view, points of view. And the justices went on to state, 
Indeed, it is not easy to imagine how a government could function if it lacked this freedom. If every citizen were to have a right to insist that no one paid by public funds express a view with which he disagreed, debate over issues of great concern to the public would be limited to those in the private sector and the process of government as we know it radically transformed. To govern, government has to say something, and a First Amendment heckler's veto of any forced contribution to raising the government's voice in the marketplace of ideas would be out of the question. Essentially, uh, what that government speech doctrine in relation to uh, the proposed petition counselor under state law, the attorney general is allowed to give an opinion and an explanation as far as the legal consequences of something being proposed on the ballot. It has to be an objective and clear statement, but it also can express what the legal consequences are. And if you want me to express those legal consequences, I'm glad to do so. Yes, because <coughs> actually we're talking about a decision in 2009. Is that right? Uh, citing a decision in 1991? Right. Yes, sir. What was the, once again, when was the, the 2009 decision? What was that called? That was uh, Pleasant Grove City, Utah versus okay. Sumum, S-U-M-M-U-M. -M -M. Mm -hmm. That came out in 2009 by the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay. Um, I guess... When I heard about this, I was kind of surprised because in the initiative itself, it specifically says that nine individuals, eight council members and the mayor, can get out there and say anything they want. And here we are, we're the leaders of the city. How is that restricting the city from getting its message out? Well, Councillor, you have in the whole scope of things, you have state law which allows uh, government, local governments to uh, prevent, present factual information to the voters on any ballot issue. And the proposed petition would silence even educational efforts, and it talks about political efforts, whatever that could possibly mean. But it also talks about education efforts, and that's specifically allowed by state statute. And where the government speech doctrine comes in is you would have government's ability to speak in an educational manner would certainly be covered by the government speech doctrine. And, I, and I, my point was I failed to see how legally this petition could be upheld when the U.S. Supreme Court is clearly identifying that the government does have a right to speech and in particular to educate the voters. Yes, but the petition itself says that the nine leaders of the city government can get out there and they can educate if they want to or doesn't make any difference. Basically, the petition is saying that elected officials can do that, but <clears throat> non-elected officials who are employed by the city government cannot. The language of the proposed ordinance states that City of Sioux Falls is elected, appointed officials, employees, and all persons serving to represent city government cannot use taxpayer-funded resources to uh, do political or educational campaigns dealing either directly or indirectly in a competitive manner with measures that have placed, been placed on the ballot by its citizens. And what that means, Counselor, in plain language, is you are putting a gag order on city government from even expressing educational information. What we're saying, what the petition says is that money, city mo taxpayer money cannot be used. That's true. That's true. But continue on down to the last um, sentence or so where it talks about ex explicitly this does not mean or uh, the petition says that elected officials can go out and campaign for this or against or whatever. We are the leaders of the community. This is not restricting the city government from having its views expressed. I'd respectfully disagree with you on that, Counselor. Could you read that sentence where it talks about? Um, well, again, the sentence I just read talks about how city government, elected officials, appointed officials, or anyone acting on behalf of the city cannot engage in any educational campaign. And that is putting a gag order on government speech, which is protected through you know, decisions by the US Supreme Court. 
Yeah, and, and that one sentence about in the petition about at the end of the petition, it talks about that elected officials can personally campaign, but again, that's a separate issue. Here we're talking about government speech, government as an entity, and the only way practically a government can speak is either through its appointed or elected officials or its employees. That's it. So the city government can have its views expressed through its elected officials. But again, the government speech doctrine also states that it can talk in terms of presenting factual information yes. to the voters. And so the mayor or any city, city statute. The mayor or any city council member can get out there and express all kinds of facts they want to. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess what I'm wondering here is since there is this difference of opinion as to whether the city can have its views expressed um, by this petition. Uh, where do we go to from here? Well, Councilor, as you're aware, I mean, our office is certainly very cautious about anything done with public funds in terms of PowerPoint presentations and so <coughs> forth. And we review those to make sure they are factual in nature and not advocating a particular position or for a particular candidate. And certainly I've been monitoring the case law over the last few years and there are state Supreme Courts across the country that are dealing with the same public funds prohibition for advocacy that we have in South Dakota. And just to give you a flavor of what those decisions are almost uniformly holding is uh, cities can pay or local governments can pay for the design and concept drawings even when a government entity is the one urging for that particular construction of a project. And these courts have stated the voters need to know what they're voting on. Uh, courts have held that employees can present informational talks to citizen groups and even express their viewpoint on a ballot issue. Uh, you can place items on a city website that inform anyone in visiting, excuse me, the website what the city council would do depending on the outcome of an election. The website is not a public forum and not required to allow pro and con groups access to it. Uh, cities and local governments can place all historic items, meetings on a city website to allow the voter to see the progression, how the item came onto the ballot and how city leaders viewed the issue. Uh, courts have even held that the city can publish a newsletter, distribute pamphlets explaining what the city council would do if a particular measure fails or is adopted. Of course, you can remind everyone to vote in the coming election as much as possible. And again, each one depends on the specific nature of the communication on how the courts, but generally that's where they're coming down. And so we have some citizens in Sioux Falls saying, hey, we want to have more restrictions here on the city government. Not eliminating the city government from being able to express its views or express facts or whatever the case might be. That's what we have. The only in dicta the U.S. Supreme Court has stated two exceptions to the government speech doctrine. That, of course, that we can't uh, violate the establishment clause, meaning religion, on a particular religion. And the other is it allows states to have prohibitions regarding advocacy. But certainly this proposal goes way beyond to educational activities as well. Councilor Erpenbach? I just, I'm not sure I understand this conversation because I, I think that our attorney is telling us about Supreme Court decisions that have already determined that this sort of petition or this sort of um, ordinance would be, um, go against the rights of the government. So my question then is, or I guess the answer to the question that, that Councilor Staggers had was, <clears throat> What do we do next? Well, you can certainly let the petition go and let it be signed, and we can certainly vote on it. And then we can see who pays the court bills when we're sued because we violated the Supreme Court rulings over and over and over again. So, I mean, that's the next step. I mean, certainly, these folks have the, the opportunity to do this, and people can sign the petition if they want, but it's going to put the city in a, an expensive position because if that becomes law here, we're violating Supreme Court decisions and well, I don't not think, comfortable with yeah. that. You know, Councilor Staggers? Yeah, I don't think that's uh, absolutely clear at all, that we're and, violating a Supreme Court decision. 
And we have varying opinions here, and that's mm -hmm. why it's government that's, is great. And I guess it, it probably, if this goes to a full vote, it, it probably would come to a court decision from mm -hmm. what I'm hearing and seeing. Um, question for you, um, Attorney Fife. <coughs> Is our position, it seems to me, has been one of a more conservative nature, not advocating, but actually sitting on the sidelines and saying, we're not advocating, but here's, inf here's information about um, options or the way things would look. Is it, have we been even more conservative than what, the, what you've been reading? Yes, your characterization is absolutely correct, Councilor Karski. Okay. okay, thank you. Other questions? Councilor Staggers. Yeah, just, just one other thing here. You know, there is a concern that, that you know, in, especially in talking about the pool issue, has the city really been just fact-oriented? <coughs> and what I mean by that is that on the ballot, April 8th, um, citizens are going to be t able to vote for an outdoor pool. That's it. But how does the city approach this issue? Oh, yes, we have some pictures of an outdoor pool. And then the city's also talking about an indoor pool. And that's something they've wanted for a very, very long time. And they've wanted to have it at Spellerberg Park. So is this really just education? Why are we talking about an indoor pool? The issue is an outdoor pool, but we are spending lots of time talking about an indoor pool. I don't think we need a rebuttal to that unless somebody would like to make another comment. Um, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Question for our city attorney. David, uh, on this, you've pretty much stated that you feel this is unconstitutional or that this would be overturned in the courts, correct? I, I, believe, I believe so, Councilor Anderson. Just based on the government speech doctrine, when you're prohibiting educational uh, communication that's clearly allowed by state statute and then come in with a proposed ordinance to try and overturn that, I, I think it would be illegal. Um, if I may, please. <clears throat> um, in this case, since it is being uh, contested by Councilor Staggers and maybe some others within the community, and these are state statutes, could the next step also to get an opinion from the state's attorney general on this so that we have that opinion before this, if it does go to a vote? I, in idea. exploring that type of opinion in advance, Councillor, I can tell you it would not be given at this juncture. Uh, the courts, especially in terms of asking them for what's called a declaratory judgment, meaning declare what's, what's legal and what isn't here, courts have uniformly held that they're not going to make those kind of decisions until it either makes it onto the ballot and the voters approve it, and once it's so-called ripe for decision, at that point we would get it, we could get a decision from the court. And the, the attorney general uh, has historically been very reluctant, especially if it's going to potentially be a ballot issue to give that type of opinion uh, that far in advance. Thank you. No other open discussion? Thank you. Councilor Jameson. I just want to let everybody know that this is their lucky day. Uh, a couple days ago, I couldn't talk. So today I get to talk a little bit. Uh, my voice is a little rough, but I wanted to talk about item eight tonight on the council agenda. It's the first reading. It's our revision to the TIF uh, ordinance. And it's been modified uh, a little bit through conversations with uh, others. Uh, one of the changes I just want to make you aware of is that the language in there that was about throughout the life of the TIF, um, there'll be an amendment to change that so it's only like two or five years. And the, the intent of that language is to make sure that uh, TIFs aren't approved and then somebody who uh, had a hand in approving that TIF now becomes one of the investors. This allows a little time so from what I understand these groups get their funding together and it kind of sticks. So we don't need to do it the whole life of the term. And the whole process is just that <clears throat> if that structure should change that they notify the city within 30 days. So even if it should change, it isn't too burdensome. But from what I'm hearing is those structures don't change much after they're pretty well set. And I, and I, and I was gonna ask too the city attorney, as long as he's getting hammered by everybody, 
the, uh, I can't remember how long a TIF is alive. I think it's a year once it's approved, and if nothing happens and then it dissolves, is it a year? No. In terms of, excuse me, in terms of 20 years total up to No, if uh, the council approves the TIF, but the developer takes no action, for instance, somehow something happens. I, I believe it's, I can't remember off the top of my head, a year sounds accurate. I believe it's three. Is it three? I can't recall I believe it's off the top three. of my head. Okay, we just want to get past that term, but that was one of the numbers I needed to get to. Um, and I know there's other pieces to this that'll change if, if anybody wanted to share some of their thoughts on the uh, language, or I can, I can share it as well. The uh, concern has been about all persons, all people investing in this, that they all be disclosed, even if they have a dollar. And uh, I'm finding out that that's not quite uh, workable but uh, what we've come through and maybe compromised uh, in is around a 10% ownership stake. That if you have 10% invested in the entire project, those are the only ones who would be required to sign on the line. And um, I had a great meeting with uh, Brent O'Neill last week, and I've talked to multiple developers over this issue, and they all feel as though this is a workable solution compromises it allows the public to understand who's investing in these TIFs but without them disclosing their uh, uh, their smaller investors who would not want to be disclosed but it puts the whole uh, the whole process in a better light better transparency um, without jeopardizing the TIF tool that we think and we utilize so efficiently here uh, that I think we have a working solution at hand. So just wanted to be aware of those changes. Councilor Erbenbach? Question, Councilor Jamison. Clarify the 10% for me. Would it be someone who owns or has 10% of the, the equity or the investment in the project? 10% of the entire project. If it's equity, fine. If it's a... Uh, so if it's a $100 project and they put in 10 bucks or more, their name's on the list. Yeah. Okay. All right. In a lot of the cases, what I'm understanding is that the developers have uh, syndicates or groups that come together, and you know, if it's a $50 million project, uh, they've got a lot of people who are investing 100000 And that's their, that's their uh, intellectual property, as they refer to it, and they don't want to lose those guys, and I get that. Um, but I think it also provides disclosure in the whole process and a lot of credibility to our decisions by showing who these people are and the fact that there's probably 50 potentially 50 or 10 people, more than one, who are receiving this TIF. And as we've all received uh, criticism that certain people get preferential treatment about TIFs, that's not the case. There's a whole lot of other people who are utilizing this and have their, uh, their, uh, their whole credit at stake in some of these projects. So they're weighed in pretty heavy. So I think it'll help educate the public about the TIF, who's getting it, and what's getting done with it. So, uh, anyway, <coughs> just, just some conversation. Councilor Erbenbach. And I just wanted to add to that, and I let individual council members know today that, that I would make a motion to move the second reading to the beginning of March. That would just ensure that um, Councilor Entman would be here for the vote <coughs> as well. He's been actively involved with uh, the TIF conversation over the period of years that we've been talking about it. I just thought it would be fair to him to have him able to vote on it. So that would be a motion I'll make today. Anything else? Councilor Anderson, Jr. Yes, I want to speak to an article in the Argus Leader yesterday of a significant land purchase uh, in uh, the eastern part of downtown Sioux Falls. Uh, the Catholic uh, Church with some partners have purchased the old phone uh, building that was utilized for their service staff. And uh, I think their vision is, is one of of greatness for our city and in the fighting of uh, poverty, homeless. You know, we talk every year we talk about a warming shelter. Um, you know, even though the city isn't responsible for the homeless or anything, we have been uh, involved in the discussions and feel that this is something that did need to be spoken about. Uh, I think it's a, a great purchase. 
I think it's the right location. And I feel that uh, with some visioning and maybe even a little help from the city sometime in the future, who knows, uh, that that building can be a, a major contributor to that area in the city of Sioux Falls. Councilor Erpenbach. Councilor Anderson, thanks so much for bringing that up. I just wanted to clarify the purchase hasn't, has not been made yet. It is contingent on a conditional use permit, and that involves um, getting neighborhood buy-in to this project. There will be a neighborhood meeting next week. I don't have the dates, I apologize. But there is a neighborhood meeting so that those folks in that Whittier area will understand more what's, what's potentially going to happen there. If they don't get the conditional use permit, the sale will not happen. Well, and if I may, speaking Please. to the community, uh, there's a lot of no secrets in Sioux Falls. And I, I've already had a lot of uh, citizens in that area approach me and that had it heard that uh, there was something going on with that facility. And uh, I think that we can build a support for that. Absolutely. Great. Other open business? Alrighty, we'll move on to our first presentation today. Code enforcement annual update, Mr. Kevin Smith. Good afternoon, Kevin Smith with Planning and Building Services. I'm just here today to give you our annual update on uh, how we did in 2013 and maybe to give you a, a look forward a little bit into what we hope to accomplish in 2014. So typically, um, I know I don't like to use numbers very often in my presentations, but there's no way around it uh, when talking about code enforcement statistics. Last year, uh, we had cases with violations 4,950, but more importantly, uh, we had 4,156. So if you do the math, that's 85% that we're, were corrected without having to issue any citations, no one was taken to court. Uh, it was one simple notification. Typically that's a notice of violation letter that goes to a property owner or the responsible party and they corrected the violation. Whether that was cleaning up garbage, mowing their lawn, shoveling their sidewalk, moving their car. So we're very proud of the fact that, that in almost between eight and nine uh, out of 10 cases, we can obtain voluntary compliance once we contact the right people. And granted that 15% that, that go the other direction, uh, we try and employ uh, fair and objective means when we can, and that is giving them an ample opportunity to correct it. And sometimes I, I think on the the neighborhood side of that, they wonder why are you letting, why does this go on and on and on? Well, in the case of a, a property maintenance issue, it may take a while for someone to get a new roof on the house or, or to get the siding repaired. However, um, in the case of, let's say, a rotting bag of garbage in the middle of summer, that's going to that's gonna be about a three-day thing. So we give everyone every opportunity to do the right thing, and if they don't, uh, we, we will step in. This goes back to the reason I put this slide up. It goes back to the, the audit of code enforcement, uh, I think, that was done in 2008. And one of the questions was, does the city have unpaid bills that we're not doing anything about? Are we literally just writing citations and um, um, not trying to collect any of the funds? So. Every year, uh, we work with Russ Fox, um, great guy in finance, because he keeps track of all of this for us, uh, to let us know this is where the money was going, and this is how we're getting it back. And Paul Bangford could speak better to this than I could, that in some cases, um, it's small claims court. In some cases, it's through a collection agency. And as you will, many of you remember, in usually August, there are assessments that are brought in front of you if we've had to go and correct a situation. Now, that's not the citation. That is a, an assessment for work that the city has completed because the property owner did not. Those are garbage cleanups. Those are house demolitions. 
mowing lawns and uh, clearing sidewalks, which is a common theme of my presentation today, common uh, clearing sidewalks. So question in 2008 was, what's the city doing about all of these unpaid bills? I can tell you we are pursuing every avenue to make certain that when public funds are expended, that we're getting those funds back to the extent we can. And it's actually less this year, and I should say in 2013, than it was in 2012, I think because we had fewer house demolitions that we had to do, which is probably the most expensive thing uh, we undertake. In the spirit of providing better access for our citizens to the information we have available, we don't just publish any more um, PDF files of spreadsheets and addresses and things like that. Um, I'm personally kind of a visual thinker, so I'd rather point and click on a map like you see in front of you with um, home foreclosures and vacant properties. These are registered vacant properties. So if you want to zoom in around the, the community, if you point and click on any one of those icons, information will come up about uh, the owner and who the mortgage holder is. This is one of the things that when we go out and talk to neighborhood groups, especially um, they like to know this because they're the folks living next to these properties. They want to know, is that, is that really a vacant property? Is anyone living there? How long has it been vacant? It's a lot easier for us to provide this information to them and they can help keep an eye on the properties for us. So when something happens, a broken window, uh, a door that's been kicked in, they know what we know, and we can better respond when there is a problem. Following that, uh, we also have a, an interactive map of uh, our administrative citations. Same thing. Everything from um, nuisance vegetation to sidewalk snow removal. That we try and keep this information as current as possible, and this is something that I think the public does need to see because there are code violations in all parts of Sioux Falls. But please remember, the vast majority of our work is generated by the citizens of Sioux Falls. Our team upholds the community standards that this body enacts. So if there are um, issues with nuisance vegetation, sidewalk snow removal, illegally parked vehicles, we're, we're typically responding to a complaint that a citizen has lodged with us. And certainly if uh, the property maintenance staff is out and they see everybody down the street has not shoveled their sidewalks and they were only called about one property, chances are everybody will get notified. But I think that's part of what our duty is as public servants. Rental registration verification is very important to us. It's important to um, the rental industry as well because one of the things they've told us over the years is if we're going to provide rental information to you, we want it to be useful to us. And I can tell you from being around the property maintenance folks just in the last couple of days, they use the information to make phone calls when there are violations at rental properties. So we do use this information, but it's only as good as the people who are uh, providing it to us. And one of the things we talked to Dan Sifkin and, and Teresa Schwartz off at the Multi-Housing Association is, hey, when your members change addresses, when they move their business location, when they transfer property, you need to let us know so we can update the rental information. So this is, this is not a static, um, static document, static process. It's very fluid because the rental industry is. Why we started the, the rental verification process was at a, a neighborhood meeting one night. The, I think it was the 10th and Western neighborhood. Mary Jo Hornerman asked, do you know where all the rentals are in our neighborhood? And we said, we think so. So we went back the next day, got out a property map and started um, checking. And that has really turned into what's become an ongoing process of verifying, especially in central Sioux Falls, where we have more densely, uh, a more densely populated part of the community. There are a higher number of rental properties per block. Um, 
and we want to make sure we've got every one of them noted. So in addition to the ones we've already done, in 2014 we'll be uh, surveying the Garfield and West Sioux neighborhoods. So we're, we're working our way outwards and we will find them all and uh, get them registered because I, I think it is important for the rental industry to know uh, that we can we can contact them quickly if there ever is a problem at their at their properties. Um, I included this photograph because I, I think it best exemplifies what we would like code enforcement ultimately to be. This photograph was taken um, as part of a railroad right away cleanup in 2013. The Ellison Eastern Railroad partnered with four different. Um, four different neighborhood associations, and Russ Sorensen from our office and Adam Roach assisted as well in the planning of this, that these neighbors got together and said, there's a problem with the railroad right away that runs through four of our neighborhoods. And instead of dealing with it as a code enforcement, hey, why doesn't the city go talk to Ellison Eastern and cite them for the, the garbage and, and vegetation Russ coordinated with those neighborhoods and the Ellison Eastern Railroad on a joint cleanup effort. They got together on a Saturday morning in September and cleaned it up. And I think they're gonna do it again this year as part of an ongoing um, positive project within their neighborhoods. We benefit because they're eliminating potential code violations for us. That's a great thing and even better is that the neighborhood associations see value in, in um, coming together for something positive. They got done with this and, and I think um, it was very effective in, in them kind of bonding with each other. So when we talk about code enforcement being a community service, this is that part of it. Proactive code enforcement is not just going out and writing as many citations as is possible. It is connecting with the neighborhoods, finding out what their issues are, and helping come up with strategic plans to um, actually implement those, those initiatives. Something else we do, or we did in 2013 along those lines, when we met with the Pettigrew Heights Neighborhood Association and asked them, we can't do everything. Tell us what your top three issues are. What are the top three things you really want done? One of them was additional lighting of their streets and alleys. We said, that's a, that's a viable issue. So one, I think it was a January evening, we went in two vans up and down every street in Pettigrew Heights and every alley with representatives of the neighborhood and identified, I think there's 59 locations where they either received brand new street lights or upgraded street lights. And if you get a chance to tell uh, Mike Burkhardt from the Light Division of Public Works, thank you. Mike and his, his guys do a great job because the planning was done in January. I think they had all of the lights up. This was done by May. I don't know of how any, any more quickly they could react. Um, and not to give away 2014, but we're working on a similar project in Garfield right now that they're going to have probably a similar number of lights installed because it's a need they have and they're working with us on it. That they went out and did the recon uh, up and down their streets as well. So it's kind of fun just to go out with, with residents of those neighborhoods for a couple hours or however long it takes and talk to them about what's going on. Because when Jim Larson's in the van from the PD, he's picking up on their issues regarding um, neighborhood safety. And we're talking about property maintenance issues and, and Mike and the guys from Lights are talking about infrastructure improvements. And the neighbors get to tell us all of this in a very informal and thankfully it was a warm setting which leads up to working together. And this isn't just externally, this is internally as well. And in my time working with the code enforcement team with the city, um, I can tell you that, that we communicate very well. Um, we spend a lot of time 
an effort making sure we hold each other accountable for um, enforcement of the ordinances and the standards within the community that, that the citizens expect. So when Shauna Goldhammer and Luann Ford get together and talk to Paul Bengford about a problem that involves both zoning and health, we're all on the same page. So when that case goes to court, as one recently did, um, Paul wasn't left wondering, geez, what were they thinking with the, the enforcement of this? That we are working very effectively internally. And you can see the before and after photos of um, the rental rehabilitation loan program. The folks from community development, Brent Tucker and Adam Roach, provide a very valuable piece of the code enforcement team in that they can come to the table with programs that fit the needs that these neighborhoods really, I, I think, deserve to have to keep them vibrant. Central part of Sioux Falls, it's no, um, it's no secret that the central part of Sioux Falls has the oldest housing stock, high number of, high percentage of rentals. We don't wanna see that housing stock get diminished because then it becomes a code enforcement issue when Brent and Adam and community development get involved. Um, it is literally a night and day difference on some of those properties. The night out um, is in, I think it's in early August National Night Out, that's a, a celebration of neighborhoods. And you can see Dave McIntyre in the back, Chief Barthel out talking to, to neighbors as well. Gives us an opportunity to interact with residents when there's not um, a burning issue, so to speak. We can just kinda uh, have a conversation with them. And I know many of you, all of you council members have participated in this at one time or another. It's a great forum. We like it because we get to hear um, some of the issues that are going on that we can take action on. Down in the corner is a photograph from uh, the annual uh, neighborhood summit. And the other photograph is of a manufactured house that that's one of, I think, eight that we purchased and had demolished last year that Shauna Goldabern from Zoning said, hey, they're, they're auctioning these things off. We should buy them and demolish them. And it's, uh, it's been a very positive thing for us because that's part of our contribution to getting rid of dilapidated housing stock. So if we're not going to go through, we don't always have to go through formal enforcement. There are more creative ways uh, that we can help um, keep the housing stock of the city of Sioux Falls looking good. And where I earlier mentioned sidewalk snow removal, this is blatant, shameless advertising. Um, one of the things when I came to code enforcement a few years ago, I was um, reminded that we need to consolidate our efforts wherever we can. So a few years ago, I think three or four years ago, the housing office, the housing inspectors took on the task of nuisance vegetation inspection. And this year, and they're getting their, their feet wet or frozen, I should say, because we take, we've taken over sidewalk snow removal inspection from public parking. And yes, if you look back and ask yourself five years ago, why does the parks department inspect for nuisance vegetation and why does public parking inspect for sidewalk snow removal? Good question. So um, we felt it was, it made a lot of sense by creating a property maintenance division. So when Kelly Boyson and Dan Hine and Patrick Bowl are out looking at nuisance vegetation issues in the summer, those are the same guys that are gonna be out in the winter looking at <coughs> sidewalk snow removal inspection. They do their jobs very well. They are very fair, they are very organized and very efficient. And it's one department doing both, uh, doing all of these things. So wherever we can, We've consolidated our efforts, and otherwise, uh, we meet bi-weekly as a code enforcement team. Everyone from the city attorney's office to the health department to fire prevention, building services, zoning, or, and sometimes even public works when they have an issue, we all come together and we understand we need to provide uh, the best service we can to our customers. It can't be done in a confusing, um, misguided manner. We need to know what we're doing so the public has confidence in us. And I hope 
we're getting there. And our latest um, addition to the team, Vanessa Sweeney, who's here on a two-year fellowship from the, the CDC, is kind of holding us all accountable in that her approach is, well, look at the people who we're working with. Maybe some of those individuals um, are undergoing some sort of life crisis. Maybe, maybe the underlying cause that's manifesting itself in a code violation needs some assistance. So Vanessa has been a, a great addition to the team in terms of case management. And uh, we've been really blessed to have her, her here. And unfortunately, her, the, the fellowship is up in, in October, so she's got some loose ends that she has to clean up before we let her, let her go back. But that's all part of an ever-changing, hopefully ever-improving program for the public. And this is, just to wrap things up, this is a group photo that was taken after that railroad cleanup. And what you won't see is a lot of city employees there. What you will see is four neighborhoods who came together and did something good that benefits them. Um, and it was done in the spirit of helping each other. And I think that's part of what we need to be doing in, in code enforcement is helping these neighborhoods do more for themselves because they have an awful lot of resources out there and we have some resources we can bring. So when we show up with uh, the Public Works dump trucks to haul away their, their waste material and provide them with what we have, that's great. But more importantly, I think working with neighborhoods and helping them become more self-sufficient, um, forming new neighborhood associations, uh, that will only make everything, uh, you know, hopefully stronger for both the neighborhoods and, and us as well. So if you have any questions, um, I'd be glad to take them at this time, but I, I will tell you, uh, if we're gonna focus on one thing in 2014, I think it's gonna be uh, tenant and landlord issues that Councillor Erpenbach has been engaged in this issue uh, very recently, but um, I, I think there is something to be, there's more to be done in terms, not necessarily of tenant advocacy, but an understanding from tenants and landlords as well, where everyone's responsibilities lie. We typically get involved when someone says, hey, there's a problem at this rental property, and then our property maintenance inspectors or zoning or health or whoever gets called has to go out and start making uh, value judgments on, on violations. Our hope would be, hey, let's make sure tenants are making good decisions on where they rent and they understand what their rights are and what their responsibilities are. So that's a little bit off the beaten path, I would say, of traditional code enforcement issues, but um, that's, not that I have a crystal ball, but, but I think that's one of the things we really need to focus on in the upcoming year. So if you have any questions. Questions for Kevin. Councilor Staggers. Yes, uh, Kevin, I was just curious. Can you um, tell us how a property is surveyed to determine whether it's registered or not? Uh, how does um, that work? If we're going to go into a neighborhood, we typically get a um, property file from Minnehaha County, and if the owner address is different than the property address. That's usually a good indication that the person doesn't live there. And the way the, the verification process works is we send out a courtesy letter. And if someone calls and says, hey, I got this letter, uh, here's the situation, it's in my family, we're not renting it, then we say thanks for contacting us. But sometimes people have converted single family houses to rental properties. And if it's the one time they've ever owned a rental property, sometimes they don't even know they need to be registered. So it begins by checking the Minnehaha County property files and then we um, start sending letters to owners. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Rolfing. Uh, Kevin, what, what is the cost of um, registration? Uh, registration is free. If you don't register it, and I, I won't flip back to that slide, but here's the irony. If you don't register it, ultimately that's a code violation. So that's, there's, there's no incentive to not have your properties registered. 
I was sure that was it. I just wanted to make sure that everybody yeah. knew. Any other questions? I, just one, Kevin. I know that there's it's been ongoing, but you're not the only one in charge of code enforcement. I mean, we might have barking dogs, <clears throat> overgrown lawns, parking problems. What efforts or where are we at with coordinating the different departments that may look at all that stuff? Well, like I, I said, Councillor Karski, we meet every two weeks. Um, I try and keep the meetings to an hour. But we typically have a very stacked agenda. Uh, and what we try and do is limit the agenda items to, I would say, the more complex cases that do cut across the different departments. So that um, if Dean Lanier ha is having an issue with an illegal um, car painting business, that Shauna Goldhammer needs to know that as well from a zoning standpoint. Ron Bell might need to know that from a building services standpoint. So that, not that this ever happens, mind you, that we have illegal car painting operations, but when those occur, the right people are in the right room. And um, it's great to have Paul Bangford there because ultimately Paul has to defend our actions. And if we're going down a path that doesn't make sense, um, he can make sure we, we uh, you know, take a right turn. Yeah. So I'm, I apologize if I missed that. I was, I guess my concern was that you are, are the one that's kind of leading that up to coordinate all the efforts for all those things. And it appears to be working now pretty well. Well, it's, yeah, it's only as good as we communicate that day. I, I think that if we don't continue to work on the silos of city government, um, it could easily change. But the people involved, I, I can tell you personally, the people involved uh, are very committed to doing good work for the citizens of Sioux Falls. And that makes it a lot easier in, from where I'm coming from that I can easily send an email to health and fire and even police or whoever, and I get an immediate response and we're all pretty much on the same page. So. It's, it's a challenging job, but um, I think all of us doing it are doing it because we like what we like the uh, you know service to the public. It's a challenging job without a lot of thanks, so I'll, I'll be first to tell you thank you for what you do because I know it is difficult at times, so thank you for your work. So, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Also, Kevin, I think where uh, Councilman Karski was going, if you could speak to the departments that, uh, you know, say the number of Departments that code enforcement actually touches. You know, you already stated a few, the health department, fire, police. Planning, zoning, building services, um, parks and rec from time to time. And even um, when we draw into the, the equation public works, that I would say there's not many departments, and, and of course the attorney's office ultimately, there aren't many departments that aren't in some way, shape, or form um, affected by or, or part of the code enforcement team. Now I like to tell every city employee, you're all on the team because we, we need everybody's input. Sioux Falls is 73, 74 square miles in size, and um, you know the more people we have helping us, the easier our job is especially the citizens. Exactly, thank you. Counselors, anything else? Okay, we're gonna, one more item, but before we go to that, we do have a public services committee meeting after our city council meeting, and we have some very interesting topics to discuss there. Um, so right now we are going to go into executive session. Councilor Rolfing. I would move that we um, move into executive session to consult with legal counsel about proposed or pending litigation or contractual matters pursuant to South Dakota codified law 1-25-2, section 3. Second. I have a motion by Councilor Rolfing and a second by Councilor Erpenbach. We do need a roll call vote for this. So please pull the council. Council members Anderson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Thank you. That is passed by a vote of six to nothing. Um, at this time, we are going to ask that if you are not part of this executive session, that you clear uh, the council chambers. Thank you. <laughs> 